Welcome everyone. Ann Arbor Spark is delighted to be hosting this very timely discussion on clean mobility investment, the road to net zero. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, the transportation sector is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. As a climate emergency becomes increasingly urgent, automakers, energy companies, municipalities, and more are racing towards the net zero carbon emissions. And a big part of this is the strategy is the way they're rethinking their clean mobility investments. We have brought here today an esteemed panel to better understand their motivations behind these changes and how they are measuring their success and return on investment. To kick us off, I would like to introduce us to the moderator for today's discussion, Dr. Missy Stultz, who is the Sustainability and Innovations Manager for the City of Ann Arbor. In this role, she works with all city operations, residents, businesses, the University of Michigan, nonprofits and others to make Ann Arbor one of the most sustainable and equitable cities in America and to implement the A to zero carbon neutrality plan. Over to you, Missy. Well, thank you so much and welcome everyone to our session. I wanna give a special thanks as we kick this off to Kamal and to Spark for helping pull this event. And of course, to the team at South by Southwest for giving us a platform to come to you to take today to talk about uh, clean mobility and the intersection with equity and climate action. We are doing a little game with our uh, speakers today to introduce themselves. And so there's a poll being launched just as kind of a friendly way to get to know us. And so the poll that is before our panelists is uh, two truths and a lie. And so I just wanna share my three statements and then I'll, I'll uh, tell you which one is true and which are a lie. So my statements are, I have been fortunate enough to dine in the president of Iceland's home due to my work on climate change. I started working in climate change after an elevator discussion with Dr. James Hansen. And I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation about climate change with Mark Cuban. Two of those are true and one is false. And I'm going to share with you right now, the one that is false is I did not start my career in climate change due to an elevator conversation with Mr. Hansen. I have had a few elevator conversations with him when I was lucky enough to work at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, but I already worked there. And so I got to talk about a lot of really cool things with Mr. Hansen and a lot of the work happening in New York City and local governments around the nation to address climate change. So thanks for bearing with me. Can't wait to hopefully tell you more about some of the experiences that I've brought. But really today, it's about our esteemed panelists. And so I'd like to first introduce you to Ken Laberto. Ken is, I'm just going to launch a poll here. Um, Ken is a senior principal scientist at the Toyota Research and Development uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's worked in the automotive and telecommunications industry for 28 years. And to tease us a little bit, Ken has given us uh, three statements, and one of these is not true. Ken, I'm intrigued. Do you love electric scooters and use them whenever you can? True or false? I do not know. Although he works for Toyota, mo he, most of his work is made public via academic papers and forums. Ooh. Or he strongly advocates for vehicle electrification, but personally dislikes driving them. Oh, that's quite a statement. Uh, let's see. Ken, which of those is a lie? Thanks, Missy. Uh, the last one is, of course, a lie. Um, I love plug-in vehicles. Uh, I drive them uh, right now, um, and I am very excited about the future when we'll see more and more of these um, come into popular use. And just FYI, whenever I'm traveling and I need to go find a restaurant, I'm that big guy on the tiny little uh, scooter uh, who just probably drove too close to you. So I do apologize. And thank you for that image. I really feel like we're going to be on the lookout. And now I'll start yelling, hi, Ken, to whoever I see in that situation. So that's delightful. Our second esteemed panelist, uh, panelist today is Sophia Nadua. Sophia is a managing partner at BP Ventures. At BP, she's helping to create customer-focused businesses that enable more sustainable movement of people, goods, and services using EVs, cabs, and related transport-linked tech 
platforms. And so to learn a little bit more about Sophia, we have to decipher which of these statements is fault. false. She hates electric bikes. She's a trained lawyer and serves as a judge where she owns an electric car and is a passionate EV advocate. Sophia, help us. Which one of these statements is not true? I love electric bikes. I have a Brompton electric bike, which uh, when, when, I, when I could ride to work, I would uh, jump on the ground and take a bike to work. I just, I love it. Well, that's great. Well, we'll certainly be talking about micromobility in today's panel. And so now you're an expert who can help us, uh, you and Ken. You're not competing for the same platform, so that's great. And our third panelist is Sean Gouda. Sean is a manager at DTE, a Detroit-based diversified energy company involved in the development and management of any energy-related businesses and services. Thanks for joining us, Sean. And now we have to figure you out. So which of these is not true? He studied abroad in Egypt and China. He rebuilt a 1983 Jeep CJ7. Hmm. Or he went on a road trip in a Chevy Bolt from Detroit to New York. Sean, help us. Which one of these is simply not true? The going on a road trip in a Chevy Bolt from Detroit to New York. <laughs> really? Yes. Well, that was true. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to have to get some tips on rebuilding some vehicles here. That's a pretty sweet endeavor. That yeah. was my high school graduation project for uh, auto mechanics. All right. Awesome. Well, I hope you can all tell we have some incredible experts and really fun individuals joining us for today's session. So to kick it off, um, I'd like to open the floor with a pretty direct question. Climate change, racial disparity, growing economic inequality. These are real issues facing society now. How does clean mobility intersect with these issues? And why do you think it's important to pay attention to clean mobility right now? You know, the obvious observation is, is racial and socioeconomic um, divisions in our society are not random. They're, they're definitely correlated. I think transportation is a huge enabler uh, for jobs, educational, cultural opportunities, People, especially in, in uh, tough socioeconomic uh, situations, aren't really able to, you know, take a part in a lot of these things. Um, at least today, in 2021, um, a lot of the things that we associate with green and uh, sustainable transportation generally uh, are a little too expensive for a lot of um, people. And thank, thank you for naming that. I think that's something we're experiencing pretty viscerally locally in Ann Arbor as we're working on things like fleet electrification and of course bringing more micro mobility into the mix to help kind of level that. But access is a really important point and Sophia, you talked on it too, um, more from a global scale. Sean, what are you thinking about from the landscape of GTE? It's, there's no better time. I got into this business three years ago at the utility where we stood up a, a department that is uh, strictly looking at transportation electrification. The time is now. Uh, when you look at all the investments, and in, there's an individual that I follow closely because he's the largest, um, you know, equity player in the market, Larry Fink. And he basically talks about, listen, folks, uh, we're not going to be moving uh, capital around if you don't have a good sustainability plan and you cannot prove that you have this on your radar. I mean, that was a big announcement a few years back, and he continues to drive on that. So that's the, the, the answer I have for now is I'm following the money, and it makes sense for right now. Now, what we can do in our service territory, what we're doing, um, you know, in our footprint, um, transit is a big play for us right now. We, it makes a lot of sense in providing the accessibility that Sophia has talked about and Ken alluded to. When I think about barriers, uh, first one is, you know, the price of the products for the transit authorities to acquire. Uh, two is the infrastructure. And three is the education and outreach as to why people would want to use it. So we're developing programming around addressing those barriers. And we think that we can really drive uh, the adoption of these vehicles and then starting to create that equity in the communities that we serve. And so really I'm excited. We've got eight all electric mass transit buses that are coming into our service territory. 
Uh, my uh, organization has gotten to partner with the transit authorities to, to make this real. And we're getting a lot of learnings and we're very excited to see how this, this takes place. So there's no better time than now. Really excited about this. Yeah, amen to that framing. Also elevate, uh, we've got some school buses coming in yes. to the area as well. So it's not just transit buses. Uh, well, one more time, thank you all for opening the conversation really well. One must. Uh, cheers for those who'd like to participate. I'm going to. And I'd like to start this next one off uh, to you. Can you talk a little bit uh, about the how you distinguish or how Toyota distinguishes the difference between clean and sustainable? You know, first of all, I'm not an official spokesperson for Toyota on this or anything. I'm just a a researcher uh, sharing my own opinions. Having said that, it is challenging. I mean, a lot of incumbent technologies have had a really long head start, you know, in the car space. Um, one of the challenges we have in persuading people to adopt these, um, our latest generation green vehicles or greener vehicles uh, is that uh, they cost more. Um, some people don't have easy access, for example, to charging infrastructure or fuel cell filling infrastructure. And, you know, they're competing against a uh, car-centric, gas-centric uh, model that has deeply taken root here in the United States and, and in a lot of places in the world. And, you know, it's just, it's really hard to compete against cheap and gasoline today is pretty inexpensive in the US. To me, these prices for the new technology have to, have to become competitive, not just with government incentives, but with uh, you know, the natural market pull that will give people of all means um, you know, more sustainable, more green uh, options. Thanks, Ken. Sean or Sophia, do you guys want to add anything to how you differentiate this idea of clean versus sustainable? In a way, I would say clean. So for me, clean is uh, trying to encourage people to move away from uh, ice cars to electric cars. So that's clean, because that helps to ensure that uh, the net carbon emissions go down. When I think of sustainability, I use an example. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles, and there's been a lot of uh, um, investment in this technology. And you're seeing uh, pilots uh, in the area of um, closed loop retirement communities, like in Florida. You're seeing food delivery uh, um, uh, uh, pilots, you're seeing robot taxis, but all of that, I mean, because of the pandemic as well, you're seeing an increased consumer interest, but, but actually uh, some of that is not sustainable and some of that will actually have to pivot for it, for it to be relevant in people's lives. And so for me, I see sustainability a bit around the ability for this technology to really embed into people's lives and actually become something which is affordable and available to the masses. And so I see sus sustainability a little bit different, uh, but linked as well to all the activities that we're trying to test and pilot uh, and hoping that enough of them uh, can become affordable and available to as many people as possible. That's great, thank you, Sophia. I, I, yeah, I loved what Sophia said, and I, I want to expand on that. It's, it's a pursuit, sustainability is, in my humble opinion. So let's take clean first. Let's unpack that. And I want to use the BEV, uh, battery electric vehicle. That could even be questionable in how it's clean, because I speak with people often as, hey, the fuel source as to which we're putting into the vehicle, how is that power generated? And there are ways to create, you know, well to wheels, uh, completely green opportunities to fuel that vehicle. So we're going to call that clean as a scenario. Then when we get into sustainable, um, and this is where I think we're going to figure this out, but I've spent some time in trying to understand this, but what do we do with the batteries when they're done? How do we recycle these batteries? And Sophia said it really well in a closed loop system. And it was, it was interesting as I was thinking about this opportunity to be with this great panel and talk about this topic. This is a tough nut to crack. It's, um, we have a set of inputs, then uh, think of it as like a process, and then there's these outputs. And then how can we capture those outputs that are not 
uh, good, and, and people can have varying degrees as to what is good, and then capture those and either turn those back into the system for creating efficiency or creating products or services out of those things. So it's an art form. I, I look at it as a journey in true north of, of if, you can, if you can attain sustainability, you've really done something. But I think that as we, as, as technological innovators and are in this space, that's the journey. That's the true north that we're going for. So clean, in my opinion, is, is that um, from, from a really good perspective from that Sophia said is let's use going from ice to Bev. We are getting clean. Sure. But from a, yeah. Sure. And that's a good point because uh, the, the thing is when you think of batteries uh, I mean after it's sort of usable life in a car in an electric car you still got 70 percent of its life yes. but actually all of the electric cars that we'll produce uh, over the next few years uh, will be able to meet all of the energy storage demand around mid mid 2020s and so what do we do with these batteries we can't just pile them into energy storage. And I think that is going to require us to become a lot more innovative and create some, what I call upcycling, you know, so yes. upcycling options in developing worlds, et cetera, to be able to use, to deploy the batteries in a different way. So I'm with you. I think I'm, I'm with you on a point around sustainability as well. It comes in different forms. It, it does. And I love that you brought that up because spending a lot of time with battery electric vehicle architecture, we're, we're finding that these earlier models that the vehicles literally built around the battery and I'm trying to get with OEMs and, and Ken, you're a perfect person to maybe ask this, but how do we build a, you know, we, we've seen the skateboard platforms, we, we're seeing these developments, but how does the battery become modular where it's easy to pull out of the vehicle platform, put in a new one, and then that second life use or that second cycle of life for that vehicle or that battery, can it be a grid asset? Can it be, what, what can we do with it? There are a lot of applications that make sense and I've We've, we've been putting a lot of thought into that, but then, and, and then once that's done, what then do we do with it? Is there a way to, from the sustainability approach to break that battery down, harvest its components, make everything usable and, and rinse and repeat? That's where this industry is going. And I think that's really what's going to be exciting because that's the biggest thing to crack in, in my opinion right now of that sustainability loop in transportation. What do we do with that, that power plant? I'm going to pick up on that. I'm going to throw something at you. I'm going to throw three things at you all at once based on <clears throat> what you said. So pick any of these three that are interesting to you. Uh, one is, I would argue we subsidize internal combustion engines and the true cost of the damage that they do, uh, we bear. So how do we fix that to make it an equal playing field? If you anyone's brave enough to take that one on. The second is, I love where you're going, Sean, kind of thinking at, and Sophia about I'll name it a circular economy, right? Like that's what we sort of talk about in the local space. And what I hear when I, I hear you talk about that is how we've only gone so far to think about like a car for a car or a car for a grid but, or a battery for a grid. But what if we actually form really fundamentally different partnerships with others in the market who we can't even think of that might have use for these materials? Like that excites me. And I'm wondering if any of you are kind of on the cusp of that. And then the third thing I want to throw out is we, by nature of talking about technology, are talking about really cool things that are coming or not coming and our concerns for them. But where I sit um, in a local government, the intersection of these cool technologies has to be noted with land use and how we design our places. And so I'm wondering if any of you have thought about and are working at the intersection of our mobility and how we use our land and design our places for that mobility. So there's a lot there. Pick what you want. <laughs> I can go first if you want. So I'll, I'll talk about a third one. So how do you keep the world moving by, while remo remo reducing emissions? So one of the way that we're working, we're looking at it is to bring electrification to customers. So we're investing in new forms of infrastructure and technology in terms of ultra fast charging. And one of the ways, but, but of course, one of the big uses of electric cars are fleets and particularly ride hail fleets. And so the challenge for ride hail fleets, because they're mostly uh, online companies, is how do they get uh, charging infrastructure to keep their drivers on the road and to encourage their drivers to switch to electric vehicles. We've managed to do this in China with a partnership with Didi, which is the equivalent of Uber. And actually in London, we've set up a partnership with Uber where we are, we are, we are creating EV charging hubs for their drivers and for private customers as well, but for their drivers. So therefore the city then get is no longer complaining about pollution targets not being 
not being met because of all these new mobility models uh, clogging up the uh, clogging up the roads. Actually, we've just announced a partnership uh, uh, with Uber in the city of Houston, and we're doing a little bit different. But the city of Houston, the biggest problem is the land, and so we're working with them to help plan, develop, and deploy the, the sites and the locations and the hubs which will then be used by Uber for their drivers. And of course, it will encourage their drivers to switch to electric cars. But we're going to ensure as well equitable access. It's not just Uber drivers. It will be available to anyone to be able to come up and use the charging hubs. But the key question that was on Houston's mind was, can you help us work out where we need to put the infrastructure and how to get the land? And as the mayor said to, as the mayor said to us recently, transitioning to EVs is one of the fastest steps we can take to improve air quality and community health in Houston. Trying to get to that is something we can all be proud of. And a lot of that actually goes back to land use and being able to unlock that and work out where is the most efficient and effective to enable that as well. I also think a lot about land use and um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about why the United States seems to be constantly uh, moving further and further from, from city centers and you know, one of the conclusions that I've come to is that we allow it, that we don't have strong planning provisions that prevent farmland to be uh, converted into a new suburban uh, area. You can almost always find a nicer or less expensive or both if you're willing to travel an extra five or 10 miles every day in your commute. And there hasn't been a lot of back pressure uh, in the economy, in the policy to avoid those trends. Um, and as excited as I am for uh, autonomous and uh, electrified transportation, neither of those technologies in and of themselves uh, solve either of those land use or sprawl issues. Um, you've seen it in the retail space. I call it dispersion. And this is not my, I cannot coin this. There is a professor by name of uh, Scott Galloway of NYU. He has his own podcast. Brilliant man. If you get a chance, check him out. And uh, bundling of services. So we're seeing that happen and it brought to the customer. So no more are the customers coming to um, a place to acquire their product or service. It's literally coming to their home. Uh, whether if it's digital, whether if it's um, the retail, th those types of things. So when I think about our business, from the transportation perspective, um, we're going to be putting infrastructure in a lot of people's homes. If you look at the way people travel, um, they it's I, I've seen numbers of 35, uh, 50 miles or less is is literally the average of of, of a person's daily commute. That can be uh, addressed with a at home charger. Is, is what I'm seeing for the bulk of the market. Let's call it uh, 70%. And these numbers are um, just from what I've seen from other presentations. It, this goes into the data and um, app management where Uber can, you can do a ride share, right? So if I want a cheaper rate, Uber will optimize a route where I'll actually ride with a stranger and that individual may get dropped off before me, but I'll get a rate. We could come up with a charging ecosystem that could do the very same to where you could have a MUD, meaning a multi-use dwelling type uh, opportunity, where it's just very difficult and cost prohibitive for us to put charging in there. But maybe on that next block over, there's EV charging and that can be used um, and shared via uh, an app with the right AI backbone, knowing that um, this individual that may own that charger is not gonna use it during that time. I can take my EV over there and for a small fee for letting me use their infrastructure, they can use it. And now we're optimizing, not having to put chargers everywhere. We can use that underutilized asset at the right time. And, and then we'll drive um, you know, affordability. Um, we'll, we'll use the land in its right way. So I, I've got my mind on that and, and I've got, some folks that I'm talking with externally of how we could do something, but I am a huge fan of pilot to scale. 
So uh, Ken and Sophia, what's driving innovation for you? And, and where are you seeing uh, kind of maybe innovation coming, like the force for innovation coming? I mean, I'd say, okay, so for me, for me, this, the customer is at the heart of it. So we talk about, uh, you know, uh, getting to net zero, reimagining energy for people on the planet. But in re at the end of the day, it's all about, this is what customers, this is what people are wanting. Uh, we know that actually some of the solutions that exist today are not as effortless as they need to be uh, to help overcome barriers and adoption. So there is... Uh, charging infrastructure, which is at, in the home, but there are lots of homes that 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 can't you can't have charging infrastructure. The same muds that you were referring to, Sean. Many of them, you must put that charging infrastructure in. Otherwise, you end up with charging deserts all over cities. <clears throat> so, but innovation involving large and small partners can help solve solve those issues. Because actually, some of these solutions haven't even been invented yet, and so there's still a lot of work that we can do with small companies. And I use an example. Um, we invested a small amount of money in a Californian company called Freewire, which at the time had a, a mobile battery, which were, they were supplying cleaner fuel to food trucks. Uh, but of course, we had an idea that that could actually scale up into something different. So we worked with them and we worked with other ecosystem partners. And we know that charging in our gas stations can be expensive to upgrade the infrastructure. And Freewire pivoted. And so this little Cali Californian startup now has a 50 million dollar contract with our bp pulse uk business because they've pivoted now to a battery plus a charger on our gas stations that doesn't need as much of an expensive refit to get uh, charging fast charging into cars and i think a lot of it is how you reimagine the partners and, and trying to understand what the problem actually is and working not necessarily on extremely high tech solutions, but high tech enough to get you there. So I think there's a lot that we need to do. As, I think there's a lot still to invent and we need to do this together. We, we can't do this on our own. Many of the ideas that, that I've heard uh, expressed by my colleagues are things that we've tried as well, or certainly have studied. Um, and the, the challenges have been kind of uh, like Sophia said, at the end, you have to provide something that the customer is actually going to spend their hard earned money on. And um, so there's lots of great ideas, some that just need a push and maybe some, um, you know, some incentives or something else. We are always interested in talking, you know, we, we, we always would want to hear ideas um you know this is a zoom call so you can see how to spell my my name there i'm ken.laberto at toyota.com email me um i'm happy to talk ken was brave enough to give his email so we'll give you mad props for that uh good job ken i think one of the things that you said sophia really resonated with me too which was around reimagining and I think a lot about that when I think about the crisis, the crises that we're in, you know, obviously a global pandemic, we're dealing with climate change, we're dealing with inequalities, kind of that leading question we talked about, and the importance of being visionary and daring to dream about something that is very different because inertia is real and it's very, very hard. So I'm wondering if you all can share with me some examples. And Sophia, I'd like to start with you. What's on the horizon that most excites you? Maybe, maybe it's like a glimmer, like a little shimmer in your eye and you like it, or maybe it's coming soon. But what, what's coming that just gives you hope? Uh, I mean, we've, I mean, as you know, there's been the Paris Agreement and that was signed a few years ago. The fact that the U.S. has now uh, resigned or come back into it gives me a huge amount of hope. Why? Okay, the type of cars we drive impacts the level of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Yeah, in about 20 years time, there'll be just under a billion electric cars on the road, about 50% of the car park, 50% of the car park. More than half of the EVs will be in the US and the EU, UK and China. But if you think of it, that, that electricity demand, which is going to be driving those EVs, is going to be huge and it's, not, and it's going to disrupt a lot of the ecosystem that we've been accustomed to for the last hundreds, hundreds of years. So reimagining that, reimagining how we use energy, 
and it's not just fossil fuel anymore, but there's solar, there's wind, there's hydro, there's loads of new energy sources we haven't even imagined yet. And how do we use that energy to be able to power cities and homes and, and workplaces in the future? That really, really excites me because it's something which um, more than flying cars and uh, okay, we've gone to the moon and back, uh, but being able to, to, to live on this planet in a, in a much more cohesive way and in a cleaner way and actually leave something for our grandkids to be proud of that's what that that that's what keeps me going and that's what keeps me looking for in co companies we can invest in and help grow and nurture to actually unlock that uh that dream make that dream come true for for millions of people and not just in the developed world but also in a developing world as well thank you for that real visceral um answer i think that resonates with a lot of us uh ken or sean Anything to add kind of more innovatively? I'm extremely enthusiastic and extremely optimistic about a lot of the things that we've touched on. We've talked about equity and the cost of things. We've talked about uh, the challenge and inertia of um, replacing one system with one that's more sustainable. Um, and just one thing that pops into my head, uh, while we've often talked in this um, in this in this panel about you know in 2040 this is going to happen or in 2050 this is going to happen, well I don't think we can wait till 2040 or 2050 to significantly reduce emissions from transportation. I I think that um, I think and hope that that electric cars become the mainstay, but that will only happen if we can buy the parts and put them together in a car at a price that customers are going to want or, you know, more directly can compete on price with this long established, um, you know, ICE internal combustion engine car. Uh, you know, BEVs are not a new idea. BEVs are not even hard to build. I mean, we literally, some of the first cars in, uh, that were ever invented were battery electric cars. Um, it's, it's not that we don't know how to make the battery electric cars, it's that the costs are still too high. And again, I would point you to just take a look at the market price and the MSRPs of, of some of these cars. But let's say we do get beyond that. Let's say that the batteries become cheap and plentiful. Um, I would love to work with Sean and Sophia to, um, you know, on the smart grid to use uh, the batteries that we're going to be accumulating and taking out of service and putting those immediately into uh, the service of greater uh, use and reliance on renewable energy. You know, renewable energy um, is great and the prices are coming way down, but again, it doesn't always, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, which means you need to store energy for those times. And, you know, since we convert a lot of that energy into electricity, well, the way that we store electricity is batteries. And so again, this becomes kind of the, um, you know, the, the ideal situation where we have uh, a lot of things to unlock um, if we can make this transition and if we can make it in such a way that it's not just going to benefit those who are the most wealthy or the most affluent, um, but in a way that can truly transform our energy system, our transportation system, and, and our society. But at the end of the day, it's three things we look at as we do this innovative approach as to what makes the cut and what doesn't. Number one, is it reliable? Number two, is it affordable? And number three is, can we grow the communities that we serve through it? Is it through jobs? Is it, we have to find ways to look at our lens and our investments of how we attack those three things or address, not attack, address those things. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, all of you have hit on this, but Ken, you've been a pretty consistent uh, proponent of thinking about access and affordability. And I'm wondering if maybe you can kick us off here and talk about 
what you think, maybe what your organization or the field as a whole is doing to ensure that everyone, regardless of income, has access to clean mobility options. The U.S. continues to be a very car-centric place. Uh, I think the last time I looked, 91% of households in America have a car. And, you know, that's not a luxury item. You don't have luxury items that 91% of all households have to have. That's a necessity or near a necessity. And, um, you know, one, I've re been reading lots of interesting papers about how, um, you know, it used to be that the urban and the poor were two words that almost always were said together. Um, but there's been a, a large democratization of the urban sprawl that, that people of all socioeconomics uh, all races are now also finding the value propositions of, of suburban living to be, frankly, more attractive than, than their other choices. Um, I would like to think that if we can't turn that around, and I'm, I'm all ears for, for ideas on how we can change that, um, we, we need to be a lot more flexible. We need to be agile. We need to have more than one plan. And we need to uh, use things that we have right now. But we shouldn't just be looking forward to the perfect, right? We have solutions right now. We have uh, cars that aren't 100% uh, battery electric vehicles, but use you know, half the gas as their uh, comparably sized uh, vehicles. And we should be encouraging the use of um, all the tools that we have in hand right now. Yeah, I'd like to hear from Sean and Sophia their thoughts too. And I'm, I'm gonna push and challenge a little bit on what you just said. Uh, this is a vehicle that lasts a long time. It's a purchase that lasts. And I am uh, I am deeply concerned by the idea that we would lock in something that doesn't make the transition. And so I, I just wanna name that I think that is important to, to think through when you're making a decision. You know, buying a furnace has a long lifestyle and or a lifetime, right? Like I'm thinking about a heat pump and transitioning. Same with a vehicle. I'm going to use the vehicle I have, but I will tell you, I am committing to going electric as soon as that that becomes viable too, because I don't want a bridge. Just like uh, plug your ears, Sean. I don't want gas in my home anymore. That, that's not a bridge fuel for me. I need to go all electric, right? So I think there are some of us who are eager to, to leapfrog the bridge and get to what's coming. So with that provocative statement, Sophia and Sean, do you guys want to add uh, kind of anything about access here? Can I just say, okay, so for me, I think electrification is doing what the, what the internet did uh, a few decades ago, which is democratize information. This is now democratizing energy in a way that, okay, I, I work for an oil and gas company, we have we are transforming to an integrated energy company uh, because we understand that people want a much much more options in terms of how they get reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy. Yeah, that's 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 not negotiable for us anymore. The interesting thing is that now with electrification, it's actually it's it's democratizing a lot. Uh, access to, to, to energy. And also, if you think of it, uh, sometimes you may have home, you may have a energy ba a storage battery, and then you can then uh, sell some of your excess energy to the community. You can do peer-to-peer -peer trading, you can do lots of new forms of, of, uh, of energy use and consumption and generation, which, which people never, never had access to. And actually, if you think about it as well, now, uh, being able to help someone by putting a small PV, a small solar panel on their roof or in their little community to live in an urban in a, in a village area, uh, that you've now given them the tools to be able to generate their own electricity. And, and, and then you need to then to provide maybe an operating platform or grid edge solution for them to connect that energy to other, uh, other, other nodes to be able to then use that energy and then create a business out of it. I, I just think that this, I think, I think in a way, what, how we're thinking about, uh, uh, how we're thinking about how consumers are gonna use and consume energy and mobility, it's changing dramatically as we speak. It's getting far more democratic, far more affordable. And now what we actually need to think about is how to make sure that that, 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 that enjoyment of this lower cost energy is spread even, is evenly spread. So everyone has access to the same tools, the same technology. 
uh, a few of the things I didn't hear you guys talk about in terms of access to that I uh, just am going to kind of throw out there and then we'll transition to rapid fire questions to round out the panel. You know, we, we didn't really talk about micromobility all that much or what COVID has taught us about teleworking and the unequal access to teleworking. But the fact that a whole bunch of things, you know, a year ago today, I did not think could happen in a teleworking space that we've proven can. And so like that has impact. Of course, land use and uh, addressing openly and actively the discriminatory nature of our housing policies and our land use and really coming to reconcile with that, uh, at least in the US. And then I, I said it before too, I think the social cost of carbon is something from a local perspective, I think a lot about, because even though we may, uh, we may feel like it's amorphous, we pay it, you pay it in your local community, you pay it in the flooding that we respond to, or the disasters and the recovery costs. So as taxpayers, we are paying a social cost of carbon, it's just buried. And so I, I wonder how we can change the market holistically by all of these points of intervention playing a role. And so it's just something, feel free to respond to that um, if you'd like, but I will tee up the rapid fire questions. So you can take any of them. Rapid fire. You've got South by Southwest, woo! People listening in on this panel, you are gonna give them one piece of advice about what they can personally do to usher in a just, equitable, clean, and sustainable mobility future, what is it? Buy an electric car. I'll go one step. Just next time you order your rideshare, your Uber, or order an all-electric vehicle. If you have yet to be in one, experience it. There are apps out there. The next time you take a trip to go somewhere, I, I use Toro and I rented a all electric vehicle, just ex get in behind the wheel. Try that as your first step. It's very affordable and it's immersive experience. I would say, uh, think about uh, the lowest carbon uh, footprint you can possibly do in your next journey. So if you can walk it, walk it. If you can run it, run it. If you can swim it, swim it. Take public transport. I know a transit system sometimes is not as reliable, but try and find or think about the most efficient, from a carbon perspective, uh, move you can make the next time you you start on a journey. That's great. Well, I'm going to ask you a left uh, a question on left field because I've got these incredible folks on the line. If you could give me and other people in local governments that are trying to usher in a clean energy future one piece of advice, what would you give me? just make it easier for public-private partnerships. Because we talked about land earlier, we talked about lots of other ways of enabling this uh, this incredible shift. I mean, the pandemic is, is a once in a lifetime shift in the way we, where we live, the way we commute, the way we socialize. Uh, we can't keep having the same regulatory environment that we've had in the past. It's not fit for purpose. Make it easier to do the right thing. Talk yes. about transformative, right? I mean, we, while I think we're all realists and, and wish for the best, it's sometimes hard to, to expect that we're gonna end up in this drastically different uh, tomorrow. Uh, a lot of us certainly experienced that uh, in March and a lot of us are continuing to. I, I am, um, yeah, I just can't imagine that we would have ever done this huge social experiment. I, I of course, I'm not, addressing the suffering and the loss of life and all that, all of uh, that is, is horrifying. But there's no way we probably would have agreed, communally agreed that says, okay, everyone uh, figure out how you're gonna school from home and work from home and not get in your car and not travel any farther than um, you know, the grocery store transform your life around these new uh, priorities go. Like no one would have uh, volunteered uh, us all to do that. But now we know a lot more about uh, a world with a whole lot less travel. You know, you, you bring incredible resources to bear and your creativity can bring private stakeholder groups together on a concept and you can really drive transformation. And, and if you like, to Sophia's point, agreed, but to flip the script, you're the driver and get, get folks and create a culture of a uh, uh, culture, you know, of commercial innovation. And that's what, that's what we're doing uh, here at the utility is we, we cannot 
uh, rest on our, our, our models of 100, 200 years, as Sophia said earlier in, in our discussion. We must become innovative and become the group thinkers that uh, leverage a commercial mindset. That's what I would say to, to other municipal organizations. Go on the offense. You have great resources Amazing. at your well, disposal. Absolutely. Sean, Ken, Sophia, thank you so much for, for participating in this panel, for your leadership in, in this space broadly, for the creativity you bring. Uh, certainly heard a lot of really important things today around the excitement of what could be coming, what we hope is coming, the need to remember equity and access in the work that we do, and the desperate need for transformation, because clearly the way we've operated historically isn't gonna cut it. And so we're gonna have to pivot our thinking. So thank you for being at the front, uh, front lines of that kind of innovation. It was a real pleasure to share this panel with you. And I am gonna kick it back over to Komal. And as I do that, and she comes on, I'd like to thank Spark and uh, the South by Southwest community for joining us. Kamal, over to you. Thank you, Missy and all our panelists for a very engaging discussion. Before I let you all go, I would like to give a shout out for Michigan House. Check out the Michigan House booth in the Creative Industries exhibition to engage with Michigan companies, people, and stories. You can learn more about it at michiganhouse.org. With that, many thanks to all our attendees for joining us today. Have a great time exploring the rest of Southwest Southwest online offerings. Thank you.